All right, so I wanted to just do a quick little once over on the whole basics of just like returning the container object instead of a null, or in this case, I'm using Python, so it'd be a none. Um, what I have here is I have just basically an add function in Python, if you're not aware, def is like the beginning of a function declaration or a definition. So right here I have an add function, uh, which is the null related one. It takes two values and then it can either return those or return a none, you know, just really super simple example. And then right here, the same exact thing, but it's either going to return the two values added within a list or return an empty list. And right here I'm calling the, uh, the add null version and I'm just passing it nine and 10, which should return 19. And then I'm printing that result, storing that to a result, and then printing it. I could just embed add null right here and not use the little temporary variable. But anyway, that's what I did. And in just a second, it will make sense when I add to that, because obviously there's not specifically a null or none type of a check here. And right here I have the, uh, it's returning a list, which is akin to, it's in a container object, basically a really simple container object sometimes known as like a sequence type. Effectively, it's the same thing. I mean, in really generic terms, really simple terms, an object is essentially a dictionary. It's just an, an or, unordered uh, bag of named attributes, basically. And those attributes could be what's effectively becomes like a function pointer, which is also known as a method. Um, and they can be public or private, depending on if the language uh, offers that those facilities either through keywords or patterns or what have you but regardless of that so that's what's going on here right so uh, so this one should right now in this situation this one's hard-coded to none and this one's hard-coded to an empty list they're both taking the two parameters ignoring them let's see what happens I'm gonna run it and we get the one none return and that's because we're printing the result right here and that result is the none so what that effectively means is that this first style of operation with the null is still operating on that null there's still an operation going on it's not simply ignoring it or passing it over um, in our case it's pretty much harmless it's just printing it but that print could represent a whole lot of other things and usually does and then down here, there's no result being turned because what it's doing is it's returning the empty list. I mean, there's a result being returned, obviously, from this function, but there's no printing of that result, no operating on that result because for, and this is a temporary variable, this is a for each loop. So it's taking each item in this iterable. Um, an iterable is kind of like, it's basically an interface. And that's what it really comes down to is leaning towards the object oriented style of thing is you want to be able to just rely on the most simple interface possible. So that simple interface would be like a dot next function method that would just return you the next thing, um, the next result from that object method, right? So in this case, we're getting uh, each potential result and right here we have it, so there's only going to be one. So we're not getting anything because it's an empty thing. It just effectively skips past that whole thing. So now we'll go ahead anyway. It's kind of long-winded, but I'm trying to cover pretty much everything with it. So we're going to flip them so that they actually return a valid result. And we'll go ahead and save and run that. And you can see they both give us 19. And so right here, that makes sense. It's adding da 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 up here, return 9 plus 10. That's coming back, printing 19. And right here, we're sending it in 9 and 10. Um, it's returning the result with this little brackets, effectively tell it to return that in a list, kind of like an array in more primitive terms. And uh, that comes back. And then what we do is we say for each returned item in this list right here, we, uh, and right there, that list, and we're saying for each result in that list, 
that's returned print that result so that's why we don't we're not seeing the brackets around it when we print it because it's extracting that but anyway so that's that right well the danger here is um, we don't want to operate on none potentially because the way that we would operate on none is probably different than you know definitely different than the way we'd operate on lists so that's usually it's small but it takes a certain amount of um, you know it takes like a dedicated statement for that and the other problem is is that that's making us in our context have to deal with that null or that none type where that's arguably a little bit too low level like that's an implementation detail more likely especially when you have object-oriented um, features at your disposal then that's sort of like going back to the old C style way of doing things which even in C that can be avoided it's a little bit crufty because you have to build up that pattern um, an object-oriented language effectively gives you those so-called object-oriented patterns or more or less of them for free so that's the difference between say a uh, I don't even know how to I don't think you could define C is one type of language but even if you want to say it's like a an imperative or procedural language which even object-oriented languages are uh, most of them anyway uh, you could still build that into the language it's like if you took that design patterns book and doubled the size of it that would be design patterns for plain old ANSI C programming because you you have to build up that boilerplate and that's what object-oriented is saying like hey we seem to like these types of boilerplate abstractions and so what if we just built those in the language for free and then we could focus more on uh, our problem and solution kind of domain instead of like the step-by-step -step details that the machine wants to hear we can abstract and encapsulate those away so anyway what we need to do here is come down here and we need to check and say if a result is not equal to none that's what we really need to do and then let's save and run that and we get the 219 so that's good now let's go ahead and flip this back to none and we'll flip this one too just to kind of stay consistent so we shouldn't get any sort of answer right now uh, nothing displayed to the console cool so we didn't that's what's up so that's cool and I'll go ahead and flip this back now run it one more time we'll sloppy test driven development style manual develop testing so what we can see now is that we had to add a line we had to add this test line so effectively the one with the most complexity now is the one that's dealing with the null just by the simple fact that it's taking more statements and expressions to deal with it and the other thing is that a whole argument of that now we're sort of like more dependent on implementation details which if we could abstract ourselves away from that these and the more the the larger the program and the more things that are being done you could see how this would amplify itself so right here and then the problem too is like so since I'm returning the list well a problem on one side but not the other but since I'm returning the list that list can not only be empty but it can also have multiple things um, if you're familiar with like a singleton pattern versus a multi ten pattern or sometimes more realistically called like a pool you can start out with a singleton and have like a logger or something say and every time you say hey return give me that logger and call this log function on it that can be really handy because then you know you're old, you're not creating a bunch of instances of loggers you're just dealing with this one logger that the duh and it works like that but in some situations you might run into a thing where like say you create a really bare bones web server you code it out yourself with just the batteries included with Python or something without using some fancy framework because you have a client you've got this potential product say that you're creating like a minimum viable product of and you really want to just get to like the feature you know some like flashy little bit of UI stuff so they can actually make it more tangible to for that presentation so you might just want like literally like yeah they want to see it like connect over the web or something say so you could 
effectively write that as a singleton. You know, that could, that web connection could literally, like, you know, nobody else should be accessing that server except you during that presentation. Maybe it's even like a closed, like, intranet server or something, ideally. But just for the sake of an example, and you have that that singleton object to answer that request and serve up that web page or whatever so that you can get along with your presentation and you didn't write tons of code and spend a whole week on just that portion of the code. You know, you spent maybe an hour or two on it. And then if the client says, yeah, they like it and stuff and they'd like to start, you know, they have 10 people a day or something that might be using it, then, you know, you can start building it up from there. Otherwise, you can throw it away with minimal loss. Well, that's sort of the same thing here. And that what my point was with that is that could go from a singleton to that multi-tin pool. So if all of a sudden that port, answering that port is a little too busy for one thread, you could, uh, you know, effectively fire up another thread. And then that once singleton object that was answering those port requests can now decide like, hey, you know, that one might be busy. So here's a uh, another connection you know and it could choose between like five connections and all that could change without changing anything else in the code so that's the whole idea there is that it's just like you just go in and change a value or two and then bam things are scaling like that quick and of course you'll have to build up the implementation deal details as necessary under the hood um, so that's what I wanted to demonstrate as the last thing right here was that if all of a sudden I wanted to um, to pass in a list of numbers or let's say let's just for right now get a list back and I want to return all the possibilities you know and of course realistically I doubt this would ever come up much if ever this exact example this is just meant to represent something else you know something bigger and whatever using the simplest possible little examples so you have this function that does something with two values now you want it to do multiple somethings with those two values. So we'll say we want to return a minus b, a times b, and uh, what am I forgetting? Oh, well, we'll skip division. Okay, so we just want to return this, right? And I'll go ahead and just change it just like that and hit F5 to save and run it. All right, so we have a 19, 19, negative 1, and 90. Okay, so it looks like it's doing everything right. And what happened here was, so that's the result from the first function, which is what we'd expect, but it's just doing the one thing, right? So if we wanted to do the same thing, we'd have to, we could just come in and like literally copy this code. I guess I'll just do that for the sake of the example. And then we'll run it. And then it returns a list with all the, the results. But as you can see, the list is displayed in the brackets. And this is different with, you know, you probably get an error in other languages and stuff. Python's pretty dynamic. So it does what it can with what you give it. But you can see these ones down here are still in the same format as they were originally. There's no change there. But now this one's in a list. So big deal. So now it's like, okay, that one's in a list. So now we just got to come down here and make this, uh, if the result is not none then uh then we're effectively back here result or i'll just say for each in uh result okay boom that should this should work oh that's right it's a list for each in result results giving us back a list if result is not equal to none for each in Okay, print each. So you've seen how much mutation and editing and stuff like this. I'm having to change. There it goes. Now it's equivalently the same. What did we do right here? Nothing. In our client code, we did nothing right here. And we were able to get this result that took all this trial and error for somebody stupid like me. Um, we effectively have the same thing right there embedded in as that was to begin with and we still have that none test and it's like oh now we're using a test should we go back and get rid of none and no matter what you're going from client code to you know the interface code then back to the client and 
all that kind of stuff, right? And it's just, it's already getting ugly in a simple example. So I think that demonstrates it well.